Gonzalez, we, we hear your point. Dr. Tranum, speak to that. This, the, he, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Gonzalez spoke specifically about the bypassing of communities and not being accountable. I think um, both uh, Angel and, and, and Dr. Anderson have touched on the, the heart of what the community concerns are. That, um, the, and part of this, I think, is embedded in mayoral control. Because when you, when, if we had a different mayor, if we had a different chancellor, would we have the same problems? I, I think the issues, the underlying issues, revolve around mayoral control and how not only uh, charter school, those, those communities where charter schools are located, feel isolated and not uh, a part of the decision making, but it's other, we get the same complaints from parents of children in regular public schools, that they are they're not being informed, they're not being uh, asked what they want, all of a sudden the charter school appears. However, there are uh, hearings that are supposed to be held in those districts. We, we check for the hearing dates. Uh, we see the, that they're posted. I, I really uh, hope in this next year that we kind of advertise more when the hearings are held so that, and that's in the law, that the, the chancellor must hold a hearing in the district where the charter school is going to open. The state education department then receives the information from the hearing, and I send my staff out into those communities. And what happens is, and it may be because parents and communities are not being informed well enough, what happens is that few people show up or that we don't have the testimony to say this is why we don't want this school. So hopefully in the next year we will advertise on our own website when these hearings are held so that communities can become a part of the process. I think the, I, the subject of salaries is something that we're also looking in because what we get in a charter application is not uh, what Angel just spoke about. So we have one figure, but we're hearing uh, from others that they, they're they getting other dollars. And so that's something that we're looking in as well. And then finally, um, both uh, Sam and Angel raised a question about the number of special education children, the number of children, English language learners, that actually uh, show up in a charter school. Charter schools must hold a lottery. And so when I started looking at the fact that the, the, the children who were entering were not English language learners and were not special education students that were commensurate, the numbers were not commensurate with the children within that district, I started sending my staff out, go to the lottery. Let me know if anyone is uh, playing games with the lottery. And what I found was that it was a true lottery drawing. So then what becomes the problem? What I started looking at then was how can you circumvent a lottery system? How can you make sure that the children in the lottery system are children that you want to come to your school? It's your recruitment process. It's your recruitment path. So if you, if you only have a certain kind of student in the lottery can, <laughs> When they're selected, you're pretty much going to get fewer L's if you don't have a lot of L's. And you're going to get fewer students with, with disabilities. So we're looking at that and trying to see how the recruitment pattern can be improved. And I think as charter schools grow, parents, uh, parents like Mr. Gonzalez will become savvy to some of the upfront work that has to be done in order to make sure that there are, there is a sufficient pool of all the children representative of that district in that pool when the lottery is drawn and the children are there. Do we, do we have uh, parents who wait online, uh, who are anxious about getting, them, getting their children in charter schools, yet kept 2,000 2, parents on the waiting list? Why? Because parents aren't satisfied with the performance of the schools in their district, and right now, this is a viable option for them. I think what we need to do as charter schools grow, because that's what the, what the Secretary of Education has called for. It has said to New York, you have a cap on charter schools, and if you want to get this additional money, you've got to raise the cap. So as these charter schools grow, we also have to have the pressure on the system, um, on the chancellor and on the mayor, 
to make sure that the schools in the districts are improved. We know how to turn around low-performing schools without making them charters. Mm. We know how to do that. And so we need to con- concentrate some energy and efforts on improving all schools that, are, that have been in existence for a long period of time that need the extra help, and maybe the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funding will help us do some of that. Steve, speak to that specifically about uh, the numbers of special ed children that are being kind of uh, creamed out of those who end, end up in um, um, charter schools. What kind of allocation is there at KIPP? Well, I first, say, Dr. Tranum's point about um, uh, raising the cap and that, that um, Secretary Duncan, Obama's point man in education, has been pressuring states for that race to the top money that in order to get that money that they have to open up uh, the glass ceiling for charters, and they've done that in states like Tennessee and Illinois, and we're hopeful that that happens in New York, but again, for for charter schools that are getting results. Uh, You know, the question of where our students come from is, you know, I said all our schools are open enrollment. We hold lotteries that are open to the public, but we do more than that. We go recruiting door-to-door around our school in, um, in Harlem over at 625 West, 133rd Street, our principals and teachers are going door-to-door sharing the news about, about this school and, and, and other schools in the South Bronx and, and in Brooklyn and across the city. So, uh, and in terms of uh, the numbers, we see academically our students are coming in one to two grade levels behind fifth grade and ending up at about a ninth grade level academically at the end of eighth grade. And the KIPP model is, you know, we have an extended day, week, and year, 7.30 to 5, Monday through Friday, every other Saturday, three weeks in the summer. That's about 60% more time learning. And if you are an A student in your old school, you're probably not going to transfer to a school where you have these longer days. And, and we find the longer days are important to take kids and close that achievement gap that Dr. Tranum was talking about let kids catch up with individualized attention, time for both math but also enrichment when you have that, that extra day and, and uh, extra time in the day. And, and ultimately, uh, our, our students, as I've said, are thriving and, and going to college in record numbers. 212-209-2900, uh, asking to hear from New York teachers, pr- uh, principals, vice principals, parents, students, uh, on your perspective on charter schools. Please let us know which out of that group you come from and where in New York you're calling from. This is WBAI. I'm Esther Amar. You're on the air. Hi, this is Carol Cornwell. It's nice to hear your voice, Esther, and greetings to Sam Anderson. Um, and I you, are, you are which? I'm a teacher, um, a teacher. in okay. the New York City Public Schools, um, former teacher, and I wanted to talk about that experience. Right. I taught at Satellite West in 2004. And the experience was really daunting. I was on the second floor of Satellite West, which has 307 on the bottom. I recently spoke to a teacher who's at Eva Moskowitz's school, and she literally has to clean out her classroom to make room for the school with Eva Moskowitz. My other experiences in New York City is this a universal pre-K program where I was a director at Mount Era at Church. I was a director of the program, um, received a salary, was told that the New York City Public Schools apparently had something to do with the curriculum and that um, we had too many black books on our shelves. Um, I was told at Satellite West we don't really do black history too much. You know, we got to pass the test. Um, I was told by a minister at a church who doesn't have anything to do with the schools, you know, we can't do too much black history. we got white kids in the program. I'd like to read you something that comes from a book um, called Cultural Journeys, Multicultural Literature for Children and Young Adults, available um, in New York City to order. The full history I'm sorry, you people can, you of can, color. You can re- people of color in I'm this sorry, city. Carol, I'm going to stop you there. You can recommend the book, but we don't have time to let you read out um, um, from it. But we, uh, we take your points, and we thank you for sharing your...